I wonder this morning if you have any life goals. Or maybe you wouldn't use that term. What things do you think make for a life well lived? Here's some I found on the internet from an insurance and investments company, very reliable source of life goals. Here's their five. Be happy. Nice achievable one there. Be in good health. Have a good retirement. Travel. Own your own home. If you could do those things, it's a life well lived. You've made it. Now, as believers, if we're Christians, then our life goal I think we wouldn't do too far wrong than to have the words of Jesus as our life goal, what we're aiming for. Well done, good and faithful servant. Do you long to hear those words when you reach the end? Life of faithfulness. Just imagine Jesus Christ is there at the gates of heaven. He puts his arm around you and he says, you've done well. I'm proud of you. Well done, good and faithful servant. What is it we have to do in our lives if we're going to hear that commendation from Jesus Christ? What does a life pleasing to God look like? What sorts of things um, does he expect? And is it even possible for us to meet his standards? Maybe you're not a Christian this morning, um, but it'd be useful for you to see this is what the Christian life looks like. You can make a decision on whether you think that's, that's a good way to live or you can disagree. Come and speak to me afterwards. I'm more than happy to chat to you. And we're taking the second half of Jude to help us answer this question. So we read the whole book and we see a really clear contrast in the first to the second half. First half is all about um, these people who've infiltrated the church, are driven by their passions, they're rejecting anything spiritual or supernatural, and they're causing divisions and real problems. So you can see in verses 3 to 4, Jude was wanting to write, to talk about the common salvation, but he found it necessary to write, appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. So the church that he writes to is under attack, and he's asking the believers there to fight for what is true. Verse 4, certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. So there are some people who have infiltrated the church, they're rejecting Christ, they're ungodly and they're just focused on the flesh and their desires. And then we see again in verse 16, these people are grumblers, malcontents, they follow their own sinful desires, they're loudmouth boasters showing favoritism to gain an advantage. And that's the focus of the first 16 verses of the book. Here are these people. This is what they live like. This is what's going to happen to them. You need to fight with them. You need to say that what they are saying is completely wrong and you need to be different. And then from verse 17 onwards, you can see there, verse 17 starts with, but you. So the focus is now moving off these false teachers, these people who are denying Christ, who are just following their own sinful desires. And it's shifting now onto how we are supposed to live, in contrast with these people that have infiltrated the church. So it's a chance for us as believers to just pause and think about how we're getting on, a refresher course on life as a believer. Now we're gonna go through very quickly 10 different things. As they come up nice and quickly and get a good sort of a well-rounded view of what the Christian life looks like, what things we should be aiming to do in order to please God. So the first one, we are to remember, verse 17. You must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you, in these last times, there'll be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. It's these who cause worldly divisions, worldly people devoid of the spirit. So there are specific threats from people who've infiltrated the church. They're mocking true doctrine. They're mocking the idea that there's something spiritual. It's all about what you feel, what makes you feel good. That's how you need to live. There's a, a very natural way to live, isn't it? It's following our desires, following our instincts. This is our default setting as humans. 
we've got that internal pull towards certain ways of living. The Apostle talks about living by sight rather than by faith. And the world around us is also constantly tugging us and saying, come on, live like this. Follow your desires. Be true to yourself. You do you. All these messages that we're hearing. But what Jude tells us here, we must remember the teaching of the apostles. If we're going to live well, we need to build our lives on the word of God. Because there are voices inside you from your sinful nature. There are voices outside you from the surrounding culture who will try and push you and tell you to just follow those desires. But we know that a life well lived is one that is built on God's word. So the first thing that we need to be focused on is the word of God, remembering it. The apostles' teaching is shorthand really for the New Testament. So do you take advantage? Do I take advantage of the different opportunities to remind ourselves of God's word? We're here this morning. That's great. We're here reminding ourselves of the truth as we go out into the world and all these other voices start crowding in. It's a chance to pause and to remind ourselves of what is right, what is true. Do you take advantage of coming to God's word privately by yourselves each day? Um, there are home groups on. It's a great opportunity together to come and meet around God's word. Or are there opportunities for one-to-one -one where you pick up a coffee and sit down together and study God's word? Do you text God's word to each other? We need to remember God's word. We need to build our lives on God's word if we're going to live well. The second thing, we see in verse 20. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith. Now this term here, building yourselves up, it's a plural term. It's about building one another up. We're to build one another up in our most holy faith. Now by most holy faith, the things that we believe to be true. So we are together to build each other up in the things that we're to believe. We're to remind each other of the gospel. This is how Paul puts it in Ephesians 4, 15 to 16. Speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Paul is saying there, how do we build ourselves up in love? We speak the truth in love to one another. Now that phrase, I think, sometimes is only used in terms of going to someone and telling them how they're sinful, um, which it can sometimes involve, but I think it's bigger than that because the truth is more than just you're selfish, you need to sort your life out. Um, it's all the truth about God. We build each other up, as we speak God's word into one another's lives, positively as well as negatively in that sense. If we're going to please God, if we're going to make it safely to heaven sure, we need each other. Because there will be times when I am starting to forget God's word, when I'm starting to drift away, when the voices of the world and the voices of my sinful nature are tugging me in a certain direction. And I need you, I need other believers to speak God's word into my life because I might not be doing that for myself. And this is how the church is built up. It's as the believers, speaking the truth in love, build one another up. So secondly, that's what we're to do. If we're going to please God, we need to be together speaking God's word um, to one another. So I wonder, into whose life you are speaking the gospel? Into whose life are you bringing God's word. This is not just the role of the pastors or the elders or the teachers, or the Sunday school teachers or whatever. This is the role of every believer. Every single believer should have at least one other person that they are speaking God's word into. Whether that's one-to-one, -one, whether that's texting, whether that's home groups. Um, so please do be doing that because that is the essential work of the church, just speaking God's word to others. Thirdly, see now in the second half of verse 20, we want to please God with our lives. We need to be praying in the Holy Spirit, which is an interesting term. And there's a real contrast here with verse 19. The people who have come into the church 
are described as being devoid of the Spirit. But the true believers are to pray in the Holy Spirit. The Christian life is supernatural. It is not DIY. It's not ten rules for healthy living. It's not something you can do in your own strength. Christianity is not just another version of DIY religion, where you've got your rules and you do these things and everything will go well for you. God himself breaks into our hearts by his spirit. And that should affect, amongst many things, it should affect how we pray. So just to help us here, I'm going to read a few verses from 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I think are amazing verses. So help us understand this term praying uh, by the spirit. So this is 1 Corinthians 2, starting at verse 10. These things God has revealed to us through the spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the Spirit of that person which is in him? So also, no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he's not able to understand them because they're spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. So some of those phrases there, the Spirit of God searches the deep things of God and knows his mind. The Spirit knows the thoughts of God. The Spirit is described as being the one that is inside God. But at the same time, we have received that Spirit. That Spirit is dwelling within us. So there is now a deep and close connection to the very mind of God that is brought to us by having the Spirit within us. We are to pray by the Holy Spirit. I think, amongst other things, that means this to be a real, a close communion with God. This kind of praying is not, here's my list of things that I want you to do, God. And while we do bring those things, and that's important, there is more to prayer than just that. We're to be praying in the Spirit. We know what God wants because his Spirit is within us and he communicates to us the things that God cares about, the things that God hates. And if we have the Spirit, we'll pray in line with that. But also there is that real connection and intimacy to God in prayer. That we're not just coming to God saying these are the things that I would like and then disappearing again. But that we are able to engage with God and enjoy intimacy and enjoy communion with him. I wonder how your praying is at the moment. I know my, my praying is far from this. Um, and it's something that I am working on and want to continue to work on is in my prayers, developing that intimacy and that closeness to God. And that's what will please him, because he has a people who want to meet with him, who want to know him. Fourthly, we see then in verse 21, here's his next command to the believers. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Now that seems like quite an odd phrase. Surely God is love. Surely you can't get away from God's love. Surely God will always love us, no matter what. How could we possibly get to a point where we're no longer in God's love? Now, we can pick this up from some of the words of Jesus himself. What does he mean, keeping yourselves in the love of God? This is John 15, verse 9. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. That's the same phrase. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Abide in my love. Remain in my love. Okay, how do we do that? Jesus goes on. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Okay, so to remain in God's love, we have to keep his commandments. What are his commandments? These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. So to remain in God's love, we need to keep his commandment. And what is his commandment? It's to self-sacrificially love one another. 
So if we're going to keep ourselves in the love of God, we do that by sacrificially laying our lives down for one another in practical, meaningful ways. And that will lead us into complete joy, total joy. My joy will be in you and your joy will be full. On the flip side, 1 John 2 verse 9, anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother is still in darkness. We're going to please God. One of the things that we need to do is we need to love one another. So how are you? How am I self-sacrificially, actively, practically loving our brothers and sisters in Christ? Complete joy in his love and in his presence is what's on offer. Loving one another is not optional. We're going to please God. We need to be loving his children. And fifthly, second half of verse 21. We're waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. Now notice the phrasing here. He doesn't say we're waiting for heaven, which we are. He says we're waiting for the mercy of Christ that will bring us to heaven. Do we work our way to heaven on our own strength? No. Does Jesus save us and then put us down and say, right, go on, you've got to make it the rest of the way. Now I've pulled you out of the water. There's the top of the mountain. Off you go. No. It's not self-improvement. It's not DIY religion. It's not pull your socks up and try a bit harder. We must rely on Christ to bring us to heaven. Example here might be I could tell my children we're going to Legoland. Now, they'll be excited to go to Legoland, but they're also reliant on me to lead them to Legoland. And if they've been really naughty, which is highly likely, they're also reliant on my mercy as well. <laughs> um, but that's it. If we're going to make it to heaven's shores and live a life that's pleasing <laughs> to God, we need the mercy of Christ. We need him to help us. Don't know if maybe you or maybe I have slipped into a little bit of self-reliance in our Christian lives. It's okay, I've, I've got this. Here's my checklist of things I need to do. Get my head down and everything will be fine. But Jude here is saying, no, you need to be reliant on the mercy of Christ because that's what's going to help you stay the course. Sixthly, we now move to three ways that we're to relate to other people specifically. So first one, in verse 22, we are told to have mercy on those who doubt. Maybe those in the church have been swayed by these false teachers. Maybe they're questioning. Maybe they're not sure who to listen to, the apostles or these people that have come in and told them that actually there's no such thing as the spirit and Jesus doesn't want you to obey him. Maybe there's some people who have been swayed by that and are doubting. How should those faithful believers respond to these people? It's with mercy. Not flattening them, not rebuking them and relegating them to second-class citizens, but reaching out to them in mercy. How are we to interact with people who have questions, who have doubts? People who say things like, how can I trust the Bible? I'm supposed to build my life on it, but... What if it is just made up? Or someone who says, how can I be expected to believe in the 21st century that all sexual intimacy is to be enjoyed between a man and a woman in lifelong marriage? Isn't that just bigoted? Isn't that just outdated? Or maybe someone can't understand how God could be loving and yet also send people to hell. Maybe people are just struggling with how much effort it is to live the Christian life. Denying yourself is hard. It's hard saying no to my desires. It's hard staying in a difficult marriage. It's hard being laughed at or ignored. Now, those questions can be asked by people who are just wanting to fling mud at Christianity and attack it. But they can also be genuine questions and doubts that people have. And when that's the case, we're to show mercy. We're to reach out to them. We're to engage with them, not look down on them, not rebuke them for a lack of faith. Not ignore their questions, but mercifully help them to understand the truth. I wonder if you know anyone who's struggling with doubt at the moment. I wonder if there's a, a culture, which there can sometimes be in our churches, if any questions are bad and people don't feel comfortable to say, actually, to someone that they trust, I'm really struggling with this, I can't understand it, I'm not sure I believe this, can you help me? 
maybe you've got doubts yourself and you've never been brave enough to come to someone and say, actually, could you just explain to me why it is that we believe this? Because I'm just struggling with it at the moment. Or maybe there are some common doubts that you know come up that you could take the time to read up on so that you could be ready to give an answer if someone were to come to you and say, is the Bible really reliable? Can I really trust it? Then at the tip of your tongue, you've got some reasons that you can give them. Those who doubt, we show mercy on. And then this seventh way that we can please God in our lives is saving those by snatching them out of the fire. Verse 23. Jude is addressing all these things to those in the last times. There are many in great danger. And the image here is of a stick that's in a fire and it's slowly being consumed. If it's left, it's going to burn up. There's no escape, there's no hope for that stick unless someone comes along, pulls it out the fire. It's an image of our evangelism. In evangelism, we're on the lookout for sticks that we can lift out the fire, that we can save. The people who live around us, they're on borrowed time. There is a fixed amount of time they have to hear the gospel and to respond. And so this calls on our part for bravery, for decisive action. We have to look, we have to reach, and we have to snatch. And it seems like strong language because we believe that it's God that saves, but here Jude is saying save others by snatching them from the fire. <coughs> Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, we are Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. So God is using us to reach out. This is so important that we have been placed by God in our workplaces, in our friendship groups, um, in our families, unique situations. Each person here has a different network of people that they have contact with. And we're all called to be reaching out to those people that God has placed in our path with the gospel. But we're to remember as well, it's not about our cleverness or our wisdom or having just the right words. John 10 verse 4, Jesus' sheep follow him because they know his voice. What we're doing in evangelism is we're just speaking the words of Christ. And they'll respond not because we've given such a compelling explanation, but because they've heard his voice. They're his sheep and they'll follow him. So this week, will you be on the lookout for those sticks that are in the fire? to snatch them. Eighth thing that Jude is telling them to do, second half of verse 23. To others, show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. So we've seen some people doubt, we show mercy, we show support. Some people are trapped in the fire and we snatch them, we give them a way of rescue. There are some people who are happy in their sin. They don't care. They enjoy it. They don't want to change. They want you to come and join them. How are we to interact with those people who are willfully, happily, living in sin, have no care for God or the gospel? It's mercy mixed with fear. We've got two things to balance here as we engage with these type of people in our situation, in our context. So be mercy. We're to recognize that but for God's grace, that was us. It would still be me if God hadn't reached down and intervened. So there's no call for holy wars or crusades here. We're to show mercy to those who want nothing to do with us. I think really helpful here is Zechariah 3. I think Jude is picking up on um, a passage in Zechariah 3 with a couple of things that he says here. So this is Zechariah chapter 3. The angel showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. The Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this, Zechariah, a brand plucked from the fire? Just like we've just been reading about. Now Joshua was standing before the angel clothed with filthy garments. Just like we've been reading about. And using those two images, the stick snatched out of the fire, the filthy garments, Jude is just reminding us that just like Zechariah, was wearing filthy garments, just as Zachariah was snatched from the fire, so also we have been as well. Therefore, we need to be merciful to people because we were in exactly the same situation. But on the other hand, we're to show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by sin. 
There's a fear that we don't want to become so comfortable with these people that we then slip into their sin. We're in the last days. We're trying to be faithful and make it to heaven. We want to please God with our lives. We don't want to become comfortable with sin. We don't want to become tempted. We know that there are still areas of our heart that are drawn towards things. The stakes are too high. You can't dabble your toes in sin. You can't get close to sin for a long period of time and expect to be comfortable and unaffected by it. Hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh suggests that if you get too close to people, then there is a contamination that occurs. If these people are people who love sin, who don't care about God, and who want to encourage you to sin as well, we need to be wise. 1 Corinthians 15, 33, do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good character. So there are certain people maybe in your life, in my life at the moment, that we're too close to, that we need to take a step back from. Not that we're not going to try and snatch them from the fire, but we need to be wise. We need to recognize that our hearts are tempted in certain ways and spending a lot of time with people who enjoy sin in ways that we're tempted might ultimately end up being unhelpful for us. So which side do you maybe fall on? The no fear side where you just think it's okay, you can get nice and close to people and then start feeling those pulls. Or maybe you are tempted to fall down on the no mercy side and there's a pride and a looking down on the people who are behaving in ways that we think are completely wrong. And we need to get that balance between fear and mercy with those people. Ninthly, we're to rely, and I've slightly cheated with these last two because they're not direct commandments, um, but I think they're really important to give us a really well-rounded view of the Christian life. So the first eight activities that we've looked at, you might feel... Uh, it's a bit tough, it's a bit hard. Another sermon on all the things that I should be doing better, like reading my Bible and evangelizing and praying, and I'm um, just a bit rubbish. Or maybe you think, actually, where's the grace in all this? This all sounds a bit works-based, doesn't it? I've just got a quote here from Kevin DeYoung that's really helpful, I think, in this regard. He says, Salvation is all of grace from start to finish, but reveling in God's grace does not mean we should revel in being spiritual failures. He does not mean for us to feel bad all the time. He does not mean for us to be lackluster disciples. He does not mean for us to be constantly overwhelmed. He does not mean for us to feel guilty all the time. God does not mean for Christianity to be impossible. On our way to heaven, are we doomed to a life of guilt, impossible standards and failure? Is it possible for the Christian not only to be forgiven of his sins, but live a faithful and forgiven life, so that when he reaches heaven's shore, God will greet him there with the words, well done. We know this is possible because the Bible tells us so. In the simplest terms, all Jesus asks is that we trust him enough to walk with him, listen to him, and depend on him for everything. We see here in verse 24, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and present you blameless before the presence of his glory. It's not to you who is able to keep yourself from stumbling and to present yourself blameless. It's to God. God is the one who is able to stop us from stumbling. God is the one who can transform our lives. He can make us right for heaven. He can make us blameless. That's a great encouragement. Here's Kevin Young again. Let us not minimize the work of Christ by making him half a savior, strong enough to save us from our sins, but not strong enough to transform our sin-stained lives. If we're going to do this life well, we have to have support. We have to be fully reliant on the one who can keep us from stumbling and present us blameless. There's hope for us. And then tenthly and lastly, if we're going to please God with our lives, it's what it all boils down to. We're called to worship God. Verse 25, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. And this last one, really, it motivates all of the other nine. If we get this one right, if God is the forefront of our hearts, why are we going to listen and remember the apostles' teaching? Because it's about God, and we love God, and he's glorious. Why are we going to build one another up? Because the glory of Christ is seen in his transformed bride. Why are we going to pray in the Spirit? 
Because God is glorious and we can have intimate communion with him. Why do we want to keep ourselves in the love of God? Because there's no better place in the entire universe to be. Why wait for heaven? Why work hard for heaven? Because there we'll see him face to face. Why show mercy to those who doubt? Because then we can image God. We can be like the God who showed mercy to us. Why snatch others from the fire? Because then we're building his bride. Why should we fear those who are unrepentantly sinful? Because we know that our hearts are tempted to worship other things. We don't want to be dragged away to worship what is false. Only Christ can satisfy the deepest desires of our heart. And why do we rely on him? Only he is great enough, powerful enough to keep us from stumbling and present us with confidence. And so that's how Jude wants the believers to live. That's the 10 ways that we can please God with our lives. So let's make it our goal this week to seek to do that in everything that we do. We're going to sing our final song now, um, which is reminding us that we rest on God. God is our shield. God is our defender. We are not alone. We're to do life, please him. We're going to have to have his help. So let's sing together.